Um, our next speaker, Anne Marie Wallace, has worked for over 30 years in the field of healthcare and management and chaplaincy roles, and she serves on various boards of nonprofit organizations. As a member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute for Spirituality and Health, she serves on committees to enhance the awareness of holistic care for patients to include spiritual care. Presently, Anne Marie serves as the coordinator for congregation care at First Presbyterian Church, Houston. In this position, her time is distributed between hospital visits, a homebound ministry, and working collaboratively with the congregational care ministries. She frequently serves as a chaplain presiding over memorial and graveside services. It's been a true pleasure for me personally to get to know Anne Marie during my time at Institute for Spirituality and Health. Can you all welcome her now? I would be remiss if I did not begin with a huge thank you to Marsha and to Robin and Larry. I got to sit over here with them to be able to speak in the same evening with you all is a, a real treat for me. Thank you so much. Also for Stuart's opening and the way he even introduced all of us into this sacred language that we all encounter and share and live within, but continue to learn how to put words to. So thank you, Stuart, also. Robert Frost, we all know Robert Frost and would love to have known him, I'm sure. One of my favorite very brief poems that he is uh, well known for is the rain to the wind said you push and I'll pelt and so the flowers lay fallen on the garden bed so fallen over and I know exactly how they felt There is a place in all of our lives when we can relate to that beautiful poem. Either the rain or the wind was pushing and pelting, and our lives just felt so overwhelmed, and we felt like we were laying there on the garden bed, and someone needed to come along and lift us up again. So my story is about me, but also about a relationship with several people. As a young woman, I married, married a really lovely person. We had two children. Oh my gosh, adorable children. Very blessed to have had those great events in my life. As a young woman growing and learning to raise those children, those two children, I got to know other women that had children. Sometimes as I built those relationships, we would get to know one another and the children and then also the husband, and a small little community would be built. Or it was just the core right there. The children loved one another, so the mothers found a way for the children to be together. This particular woman that I got to know, our children loved one another, so I had the blessing of getting to know her. That led to also the families getting to know one another. So the community was really strong with those two families. That included eating together and learning how to ride bikes together and baptisms, holding each other's children when they were hurting listening to their pain, whatever those issues were, 
the families grew very close together. I'm going to name uh, the husband and wife, Regina and Henry, just to protect their uh, personhood. But amid all of those things, the babies, holding the babies, having barbecue together, growing together, professions being built and growing together in community. All the, ad the adults mentioned continued to grow and lives went different directions. In my particular journey, I went back to school and got a degree in counseling after having already a business degree. And that degree in counseling led to chaplaincy. Chaplaincy, as you all know, is walking along beside people and listening to the language of their soul. Oftentimes when they're very sick, when they are suffering, and indeed at the end of life stages. I am so privileged to have, after the four years of chaplaincy training in four different hospitals, and then beginning seminary, learned from many, many people the ability to listen and listen to lots of different ways that language was spoken to me the language of their soul. It could have been through their eyes. It could have been through their hands. It could have been through their artwork, um, objects in their room, the anger that was expressed, anger toward God, anger toward their church, anger at me because I represented spirituality, anger at their families, at the journey of their life. But as the expression and the landscape of their soul was expressed and is continued to be expressed, my heart and my soul went on the journey with them also. You really can't separate the two. So going through this education and then becoming a chaplain and serving in this role for several years and learning to love it as I did, my close friends, including this Regina and Henry that I had told you about and their children, knew about that journey that I had been on. And they were very supportive. At each graduation, they were there part of the group clapping and saying, you know, way to go. And I was so grateful that they were among the people that supported me and loved me because it was a continuum, if you will. So then something happened and my role had to change with these two people. Henry developed brain cancer. He started losing his balance when he was at work. Different things started happening with his speech and they were very concerned and he went to the doctor and yes, there were signs of brain cancer. This is the type of brain cancer that is finger-like and moves through and is not surgically removed. So after Henry had lots of chemo and lots of different types of radiation, we went through those valleys and those mountain type experiences of when it looked like the cancer was arrested. And he would have periods of, quote, normalcy again, that he could go out to eat. He could go to their country place. We could all ride the tractors together. We could all go back to doing the things in community that we had been doing. But my role with Henry and Regina continued to change. 
Regina had more and more difficulty hearing the bad news in the doctor's appointments. After three years, Henry's cancer returned, and it returned with a vengeance. And his speech started to go away, except for just little whispers. His balance was uh, compromised completely. He needed to be in a wheelchair. So this was a man of a very strong stature, a very bold, loud laugh, um, a real country fun way of telling you what he was thinking, and helped you laugh at life and bring you into their lives. Reduced to a little whisper and into a wheelchair. So as we continued in this journey of caring for Henry, I was no longer one of their best friends. I became their chaplain. I did not want to be their chaplain. I wanted to be just their best friend. I wanted to be the godmother of their children. When I held their children as babies when they were baptized, I never imagined that I would also be the one to tell their children the cancer was back. But I was given that role. As Stuart appropriately said, these are secret places that we wrestle with and struggle with. And I think one of my questions for you all and myself tonight, it continues to be a question for me, is who gave me that role? And who changed the role that I got used to having with this precious family? The Enlightenment era did damage on our country, damage in lots of ways around the world. We were encouraged to be individuals, to be strong as individuals, to know who we were and to know what we believed and to be able to stand strong in our beliefs. And in this role, I no longer could be Anne Marie. I was so deeply attached to this family. So at one of, actually, their last appointment with their doctors at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Regina called and asked me if I could please go, that she was not prepared to hear the news, and would I drive and come and pick them up and take them to the doctor. Of course, I said, I'll be there. So I drove them to the appointment, and the doctor said those words that we have heard in other stories and maybe in our own families. There is nothing else we can do. So Henry, big, tall, strong Henry, tears rolling down his face, looked over at me, and he couldn't say anything, and he looked over at his precious wife, Regina, and she was in tears. And so I thanked the doctor, and we hugged, and he patted Henry on the back and hugged Regina, and we left his office in silence. We went and got in his car, and I was still wanting to be the best friend to be at my home and maybe get a call and learn what happened, what I might be able to bring over for dinner. That's what I wanted to do, was get dinner ready or go buy dinner. But I was driving their car. I was their chaplain. Remember, I'd been trained. I'd been trained in four different hospitals to care for people with brain injury, they could no longer talk. Henry could no longer talk. I had been trained with people with cancer, people that were dying, people in adult psych wards. Henry was very depressed. I was trained for all of it, but now 
I needed to bring all of that training for my dear 30-year-long friendships. So who called me to do that? Who asked me to switch that role? We're in the car, and Regina was in the back seat. Henry was right beside me, and she's crying from the back seat saying, I didn't really understand all those words about hospice. I didn't really understand about all the recommendations about where we should take Henry. I don't want to take him to any of those places, and we can't go home. We can't go to her home anymore. He can't climb stairs. Their bedroom was upstairs. We can't, and the we can't, and the we can't continued. Remember, the rain and the wind had pushed and pelted, and Regina could not lift her head up from the garden bed. I knew how she felt, so what was I supposed to do? Henry sat bravely next to me in the car, and I pulled the car over to the side of the road. She was crying very hard. Tears were, of course, coming out of my eyes, as well as Henry's. I thought we might just all need to take a break. So I pulled the car over, and I looked over at Henry, and he said, please take us home to your home. That's what he asked. Please take us home to your home. Somehow, I must have been prepared for that moment. I turned the car back on, and we drove to my home. And I got them into my home, and we rearranged the master bedroom. And they moved into my home, and we called hospice. And they came and brought a hospice bed, and we scooted the master bedroom bed over against the window and completely rearranged the furniture, and I moved into the guest bedroom. I'd never slept in my guest bedroom. It's kind of nice. I never intended to sleep in the guest bedroom. But they moved into my home, and their children came on a daily basis. The children I held when they were being baptized are now grown adults having children. And so they were in my home. My home changed dramatically. The kitchen changed. The living room changed so that the wheelchair that Henry sat in could be right there in front of the television. And my home was never more beautiful than those months that Henry and Regina lived in my home. He could no longer talk, but he could say, thank you. And that's all he said. You would go in and do this or that for him, whether it was feed him his favorite thing in the world, which was ice cream, and it's all he could eat before he died, or put on his music that he loved, which was a CD that I listened to sometimes, George Winston's Piano Pieces. I recommend it. It's so beautiful. So he would just point gently over to the CD player, and we'd turn his music on. Or maybe he would point this direction to a photo album, and everyone would lay up beside him and show him pictures. And he would just nod his head and say, thank you. And he would say, thank you. And the day before he died, that was what he said. His last words were, thank you. And then it was silence for several hours before he passed away. And there he was. Months later, after that day, when I pulled the car over and he said, can we go to your home? 
in my home, he breathed his final breaths with his beautiful, precious wife, one of my dearest friends, laying there beside him. And I sat at the foot of the bed praying with them. Still being their chaplain, and they were still being my best friends. So I titled this A Home Expansion. And I offer to you tonight, I'm not sure really what I'm referring to as my home. It might be my heart, it might be my soul. It's definitely the walls of my home, but it's so much more. I had to change everything that I knew in that friendship, everything that I wanted to be to them and serve their lives. So you might have an answer to that question for me. Who asked me? to take them home with me that day, really? Was it Henry? I'm not entirely sure. There are places now that I move to in my home, walking down the hallway, in the master bedroom. It looks back like it did when they lived there. There's one difference, though. The quilt that always covered him, my precious Regina allowed me to keep. And it's draped across an easy chair that I sit in to read. So my home is a really beautiful place to be in now because their lives changed dramatically there. They encountered eternity in those rooms. They showed me a picture of eternity. They showed me more about the God that I love and believe in than that I ever thought I would see and encounter. So for that, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful to you all tonight listening to this story. It's, it's very sacred to me. I'm still learning from it. I'm, I'm still learning what community means. I changed through this story from being an individual with a profession to a woman that stands very enriched by community. Thank you very much. So I really meant it when I said that this was going to be a special evening. I honor the fact that it is difficult to put into words the emotions and bodily knowing that's inherent in these sacred stories. I thank the speakers for engaging in this secret talk with us, for offering us a part of themselves. It's something that's difficult, and we're privileged to have heard from them. And I thank you for all being here to receive their words and to have them reverberate in your soul. Thank you so much. We hope to see you again at the ISH. Drive home safe.